reasons. Please join me in welcoming to the Distinctive Voices podium, Dr. Excuse me, Ms. Carolyn McAndrews. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be here tonight to talk a little bit about how San Onofre operates, what measures we have to ensure the safe operation, to also look at um, our actions that we've taken since the Fukushima event, and to talk a little bit about um, used fuel. Before we get started, I want to cover a little bit of background. Um, Southern California Edison is the largest electric utility in California. And uh, as, as you heard, we have um, quite a large uh, uh, customer base, about 4.8 million residential and business customers. In terms of nuclear power, we have um, 104 nuclear reactors around the country, and four of them are in California, two of them which we operate and two which PG&E operates. Nuclear power is a valuable source of electricity from the standpoint of not contributing to greenhouse gases. So as you can see by the slide up here, it's equivalent to about 539 passenger cars per year that we save in terms of greenhouse gases. It also, by having the diversity of fuel, allows for um, a mix of, of, and allows for competitiveness in terms of not relying on one single source. In terms of California, about 19% of the electricity comes from nuclear power. And that's about similar to what it is on the US basis. So nuclear power, what is that? I want to talk a little bit about how the energy is produced. One little pellet, which is about the size of the tip of your pinky finger, produces enough electricity for, well, equivalent to three barrels of oil, one ton of coal, and you can see 5,000 pounds of wood. Each household uses about 3.5 pellets per year. So that's a lot, of, a lot of power that's coming out of that pellet. So within our reactor core, one of our reactor cores, there's about 20 million pellets. Each of these pellets are stacked up into something called a fuel pin. Again, about the size of your pinky. And they're all arranged in a 16 by 16 matrix, 13 feet long. And that makes up a fuel assembly. Those fuel assemblies, 217 of them, are in each of our reactor cores. I'll talk a little bit more about how that works. First, more specifically about San Onofre. We started construction of Units 2 and 3. Notice it doesn't start at Unit 1. Unit 1 actually was shut down in 1992 time frame, and it was operated throughout the 60s, 70s, late 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, units 2 and 3 came online in 1983, and they produce about 2,200 megawatts of electricity. You can see where we're located right in the northern portion of San Diego County, just south of San Clemente. I'll tell you that we take our location and the people around us very seriously. About 2,500 of us, people who work there, who operate and maintain that plant, and safety is our number one priority. I want to go a little bit about plant orientation. Hopefully you can see this. Um, we have units two and three. Those are the containment dome structures, and I'll talk a little bit more about those. This obviously is the ocean, and along this wall here is our tsunami wall, and we'll talk about how that was designed and constructed. You also notice there are several tanks, tanks here and here. Those are all seismically designed tanks to provide emergency water were there to be an emergency. It also provides normal makeup water. It's a way in which we store all our water. There's also additional water tanks. Water is important, and here also. Water is important, um, again, 
I'm going to focus a little bit about on our ability to respond to emergencies, because I know following the Fukushima event, that's where a lot of people have concerns. But on a normal basis, we use all of these components here to safely operate the plant. Right here is a turbine building. There's two of them. And then in this section here is called the intake structure. And we take water from out in the ocean to cool the water that ultimately turns the turbine. And the turbine ultimately takes energy from the steam generator where it gets heated up from the reactor. So let's talk a little bit about how a reactor works. There's three loops in our system. The core that I talked about, which has all the fuel pellets, about 13 feet long worth of fuel pellets. Water comes in, goes up through the core, he gets heated, comes out, trans goes, transfers its heat through this thing called the steam generator. You may have remembered he's reading about the steam generators that were replaced. They were in the paper um, about a year ago, and we've been transporting the old steam generators off to Utah, and that's recently been in the news too. This is nothing more than like a, a car radiator. A car radiator, you uh, exchange heat through your coolant system to air. Here, we transfer heat to something called our secondary system. Secondary system takes water, picks up heat through tubes, comes out the top in the form of steam, turns a turbine, takes as much energy from that steam, exhausts it down into a condenser, and repeats that cycle. This turbine is turning a generator. And that generator obviously makes electricity that goes out to our homes. 1.5, 1.4 million customers. The third loop, whoops, so sorry. The third loop is this loop here, which is um, what I talked about, the intake structure. We have um, water taken from the ocean, picks up again heat through the heat exchange process, and discharges it. None of these three loops mix, so they're all separate. Fukushima, they were a, what I'd call a two-loop system. They had a, um, water would come in, it would go out and turn a turbine, and then be recirculated back in. So we have an extra loop. Their containment system is, is drastically different. They have actually two containment systems, but one prime, their containment system is not as large as ours. So if I were to flip back. Their containment system that you c could not see their containment systems when you saw the pictures on TV. What you saw was something called the secondary containment, which is not really um, a pressurized building. So this building here, gosh darn, this building here is extremely large and is able to uh, maintain a pressure of 65 pounds per square inch. So what does that mean? I mean, if you compare that to the tire pressure in your car, um, it's about 35, so this is about 65. And it's a very large container. Have you seen it as you've driven down the road? Okay. So that's how we produce um, energy. We have things called control rods. Those go in and out of the core. When we're running, those control rods are completely out. When the plant goes into something like an automatic trip, those control rods will Go, we automatically inserted by gravity into the, into the core. OK, so that's how the plant works. Now, we also design for events. So we have very robust safety systems that provide for shutdown, maintaining in a safe shutdown condition, core cooling, removal of heat through the steam generators. One of the requirements that we have, because we're licensed to operate the plant by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, one of the requirements we have is that we must analyze for natural phenomena. What, are, what natural phenomena could affect the plant, and how are, you how are you going to design to protect against those phenomena? So clearly seismic is one of our issues that we've looked at, seismic and tsunami. So you could see here that it says, Songs is built to withstand ground acceleration of 0.67 g. Most people think about earthquakes, and they think about magnitude earthquakes. 
So if I were to look at a magnitude earthquake and we were to have a, let's say, an eight magnitude earthquake on the San Andreas Fault, if you were to compare that to what you would feel at the plant for a magnitude eight, you'd, we would experience at the plant 0.2. Okay, so 0.2 Gs. So we're designed to 0.7. 0.67, and we would experience a 0.2. Now, why is that? Because the ground moves, and the energy is transferred through the ground, and California has what I'll say, the ground um, absorbs a lot of the energy just by virtue of the number of earthquakes we've had. It just attenuates the energy. Now, contrast that to the event in North Anna and Virginia. I don't know if you recall reading about that. Well, there was a, um, about, don't recall the exact magnitude of the earthquake, but when you experienced it at the plant, it was about a 0.28 G at the plant. So 0.28 G at the plant. They felt that earthquake up in Massachusetts. The ground there is very hard rock, and it propagates that energy, just transfers it through. So. 0.67G, when we designed our plant, we went out about 200 miles out to look at all the possible sources of electricity, uh, sources of fall, um, earthquakes. We also did extensive reflective mapping, trenching, and looking for any other types of uh, indications of ground motion and also to try to measure the ground motion. What we found was that an earthquake fault that exists about, point f about five miles off the coast into the ocean, the Newport Inglewood and then Rose Canyon fault, is, has more of an impact than the San Andreas fault would have on us. And so we analyzed that and we made some pretty conservative assumptions about how big could that earthquake be. And then after we determined how big that earthquake could be based upon historical readings back through millions of years, we, and that's, again, through trenching, we then added another level of conservatism. And then through the negotiation processing of licensing, more conservatism was added. So to try to put that into perspective, you may recall the um, Landers earthquake. Um, when we had the Landers earthquake, the Northridge earthquake up in there, we experienced at the plant 0.03 G at the plant. And again, it's because of that propagation. And that, those fault lines are more active than the fault lines that are around our, our plant. Okay. So from a standpoint of seismic, I want to say one more thing. The Fukushima Daiichi plant um, had an, experienced the earthquake. And it was designed to a level of 0.56. So we're at 0.67. They were designed to a level of 0.56. The earthquake that they experienced at the plant actually was, um, actually they experienced, they're designed to 4.7 and they experienced 5.6. So they experienced an earthquake larger than they were designed for. The plant did not experience, though, any earthquake damage. The damage that occurred at the plant was due to the tsunami, not due to the earthquake. After the, the plants automatically tripped, the plant systems were functioning normally. It was when the tsunami came in that they had the bulk of the problem. So let's talk a little bit about tsunamis. We have a tsunami wall. I showed you in our picture the location of where that wall would be. And the plant is actually built up at that elevation of 30 foot. Again, very conservative designs. Um, margins were put into this. And so I'm going to show a little bit about what this would look like. The earthquake in Japan is called something like a subduction zone. That's a type of earthquake. It's where the ground moves over and you get actually a vertical displacement. The fault structure, the Newport Inglewood Rose Canyon, is a strike slip. So that tends to move like this. With, you get a tsunami because of the vertical displacement. You're getting that compression and the water moving. When you get a strike slip, you don't get that type of a tsunami. So that's the, the plate structure around our plant generates that type of movement. 
So we know this, but still that's not good enough. So we're going to conservatively assume a seven foot displacement of the ocean floor. And we use that in our, our analysis and our design. In addition to that, we added on all the possible other things that could happen. Storm surge, high, high tide, storm-driven waves, multiple aspects. The tsunami that would be driven, created by a seven-foot displacement is about 6.3 feet. When you add up all those other conservatisms, you come up with 27 feet. And then we built the wall to 30 foot. Okay, so lots of conservatisms built into our design. We also, when we went and looked at putting our plant, getting our plant licensed, we again looked at the historical information to see if there were other cases. I think I'm going to answer questions afterwards. Okay, fine. Oh, very good. Thank you. That's a good question to ask. Uh, mean low, low water is um, a, just a datum point. It's a way that people m measure. It's our reference zero. And then we add all the numbers up on top of that and design for that 30 feet above that datum point. Very good question. OK, so when you went, if you were at, in Japan, you would have had evidence of very large tsunamis greater than what their plant was designed for. Their plant was actually designed um, for 18.7 foot tsunami. And they experienced about a 49 foot tsunami. Okay. So I want to talk now a little bit about what San Onofre has experienced. So again, our, our local earthquakes do not generate large tsunamis. So the largest tsunami that was uh, experienced in the, uh, our area, which encompasses San Diego, and it's because we've got a very large, wide open area, the largest tsunami that was experienced was 2.3 feet. And that was from the 9.5 magnitude earthquake in Chile in, in um, 1960. OK, so um, again, what did we experience from that earthquake was, was 2.3 feet. And that, again, our concern with tsunamis really comes from the distance earthquakes, such as the one in Chile, the Alaskan Aleutian Islands. Those would generate the largest amount of tsunami. And again, our, another factor that plays into the amount of impact of a tsunami might have is the bathymetry around the area. So you may have heard that in Northern California and in areas even as far south as Santa Monica experienced some impact from the tsunami in Japan. And that is because of that funneling effect that occurred. The area around San Onofre is very wide open. And there's also a continental shelf that causes to reflect those larger earthquake, those larger tsunamis back to the ocean. So we have designed, built into our safety is built into our design. And we look at really several different components. We look at, number one, the fission products, containing the fission products. When we have a nuclear reaction, we are creating fission products within this fuel. Within this fuel here, this is the fuel assembly, which is inside this core. You can see that. The reactor vessel is three to nine inches thick. It's built to withstand greater than 2,700 pounds per square inch. The entire piping and cooling system is designed to withstand that level of pressure. That reactor vessel is contained inside these containment structures. And again, the containment structure is very thick, steel-reinforced concrete building. In addition, we have multiple redundant systems that will allow us to provide cooling. So first thing is we look at loss of power. One of the things that was of concern in Japan was the loss of electricity. And the tsunami, which took out 
their on-site emergency diesel generators. It took out their on-site emergency diesel generators predominantly because they were not designed for the hydrodynamic effects of the tsunami. What does that mean? When we look at our storage tank, our fuel tanks for, that provide a diesel for our diesel generators, they are in enclosed vaults underground protected from flooding and they're in seismically designed vaults. This provides seven days worth of supply of fuel. Our emergency diesel generators, this is the building, this is what they look like, they too are in seismically robust buildings that can withstand, again, these seismic effects and flooding. Additionally, our switchgear room is up at the 50-foot Elevation switchgear is the essentially the electrical connection, the circuit breakers, where we supply energy and power to our pumps, which will provide cooling flow. So, were we to have an issue, we would be able to provide those connections up at a higher level. In Japan, they were struggling with that because their connections were very low and and damaged by the tsunami. We also have multiple dedicated uh, water supplies, as I pointed out. About 5 million gallons worth of water available to us on site. Th over 3 million of it is in seismically qualified tanks. So we have two trains of electricity, pumps, and valves. We also have steam-driven pumps that could supply water to the steam generators and if we were to lose all electricity. So this is a picture of the tsunami wall. And up here is where the plant is. And it's trying to reference, show you what the 30-foot wall looks like. This is another view if you look at sea level. And again, all of the components that would go into there, so if you were at high level, you had storm surge, and other sea anomalies, those are all added up and would be up at 27 feet. In addition to the design, we now have to look at what happens if the design is not good enough. And so we therefore have processes to deal with that. These processes happen to be those generated from other events, specifically this first one for extreme, the extreme damage mitigation guidelines was actually generated as a result of the 9-11 events. We recognize the need to, to have supplies and alternate means were there to be some event that would take out portions of our plant. So we have all of these backup, additional backup systems in, to, in addition to those that are designed for use of fire water, portable pumps, portable generators, so that we can hook these things up and get indications and, and information about the plant. We have capability for remote shutdown if we were to lose the control room. This bottom event, bottom process, was developed as a result of the Three Mile Island accident. So one of the basic tenants in the nuclear industry is to learn from your mistakes. Learn from the mistakes of others so that you don't make those mistakes. And in our case, we have a whole operating experience database where we share information. We are using that information from Japan to also improve our own processes. So in this particular case, regardless of the cause of the event, earthquake, some other natural event like a fire, we have capability to deal with the symptoms of the event and stabilize the plant. <clears throat> I'll talk just a little bit about uh, emergency planning and how we coordinate that. We have um, something called an interjurisdictional planning committee, and it's made up of the organizations that you see here, County of Orange, all the cities that are near us, as well as the Marine Corps, um, Camp Pendleton. We are situated right on Camp Pendleton. So we lease the land from the Navy. And they are one of our partners and will support us in, in the event that we need them. This group of people 
and I am also part of the um, part of them as part of our emergency news center and our joint information center. We work together and drill on a routine basis, exercising things such as evacuations, um, declaring events, going through the process of identifying what what actions, protective actions, we should be taking. And we practice this on a regular basis, as well as alternate means to communicate were there to be an event. We do that by focusing in on the immediate areas around the plant. And there is a 10-mile zone around San Onofre, which is considered our, our initial emergency planning zone. And we will, through our emergency response organization and working with our offsites, come up with the plans to deal with the various issues that might the issue that might here occur here and what areas would be affected. Now some people may say, well, why did in Japan did they order the US people to evacuate out to a 50 mile radius? There was a lot of challenges with information flow in Japan. And as a result of that, there were very few uh, Americans in Japan at the time and the United States Nuclear Regulatory Commission felt it was very conservative to say evacuate out to a further distance. We have looked and have evaluated, the NRC has evaluated the 10 mile radius and because we know our information flow is slightly different than it is in Japan, there is confidence in this level. Now that doesn't mean that we don't take action were there to be it to be needed. We just train more frequently in here. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about uh, post Fukushima events. <clears throat> Again, we said we had these processes and designs that were there before the event. So, but we're not going to sit back and just say we're we're better than they are because that would be very arrogant. We are learning from it. And so what we've done is we've validated the capability to implement those extreme and severe guidelines. And we found ways to actually improve our implementation based upon what we've learned. We're also enhancing the spent fuel pool equipment because we had some initial indications or reports that there was problems with spent fuel in Fukushima. There actually was not. And so, but Notwithstanding that, we see an opportunity to improve that capability. We are also and have analyzed ways to extend our ability to cope with station blackout. That's when all electricity is lost, including that on the site. Now, this, this is probably the largest takeaway from Fukushima. The whole infrastructure around the plant was damaged. 20,000 people, you know, are lost their lives. So getting supplies in there and dealing with the events around the plant is very difficult. What we've learned is that we need to treat ourselves like an island. How do we function as an island where something devastating to occur out in, out in the whole region? So we are looking at ways to extend station blackouts and are pretty far along in that process. We're also um, identifying some additional actions as, they, as we get more facts. A lot of the facts are still coming. We're looking at doing reevaluation, making sure that our seismic design basis is still adequate. Looking at flooding, what other things should be looking in terms of flooding, station blackout, spent fuel pool, and again, strengthen our emergency response, really integrating our emergency response guidelines so that they operate more seamlessly were we to have an extreme event. I want to shift gears a little bit now and talk a little bit about spent fuel. So what you see here is our containment building and then a separate fuel handling building. They're connected by this transfer tube, which is normally closed and isolated on both sides. It's open only during refueling periods. So we currently have about 2,400 fuel assemblies in our, in our spent fuel pool. Each reactor has its own spent fuel pool, so about half, 1,200 
of our fuel assemblies are inside that spent fuel pool. You can see there's uh, water, and down here, this racking system is what the fuel sits inside. It's about 23 feet at a minimum of water above the spent fuel. The tops of the fuel are about three feet or so above that grade level of 30 feet. So there's, the water is, um, again, 23 feet above that. This building is also seismically designed and constructed. So to give you a, a few little facts here, um, the pool walls are five feet thick. They're steel reinforced. There's also a double lined steel liner here. So we monitor for any leakage. Pool's normally at about 70 degrees. Um, and fuel typically stays in the pu fuel pool about seven to 10 years. And that's to allow for it to cool. So nuclear power is very different. It's different than when you shut down a, a fossil plant. A fossil plant, you can shut it down, and in a few days, it's you know, back at ambient temperature. In a nuclear f reactor, you have to continue to maintain core cooling following a shutdown and maintain the, maintain the fuel cooled inside the spent fuel pool. This is what we call our independent spent fuel storage installation. So it's dry storage. It actually uses natural convection to cool. Air comes in here and comes out the top. Um, right now, um, we have about, say, 19,000 uh, fuel assemblies stored in these modules. Again, following the Fukushima event, there was no, no damage to their spent fuel pool or their storage facilities. These are actually designed at our plant to be flooded. They could be flooded. They're seismically designed to um, withstand any type of event that we would have. Are those spent? I think I have to wait till you break. Yes, these are spent fuel pool, uh, spent fuel that are stored in here. And I'm going to show you one more picture. We take the fuel out of the spent fuel pool. We load it into a cask, this steel container. It gets um, a helium overpressure and sealed. And you can see a worker standing right there. The radiation level is extremely low. Worker can stand right there with no radiation effects. We put it into this module for added shielding, and that's where it is. It can stay for a very long period of time. The uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission has um, has provided a waste confidence uh, statement discussing the ability to store safely store fuel at the facility 60 years past its operating license. Now. These are designed very robustly, and we can, if we needed to change them out into a different transportation canister, if we were going to shift it off site, eventually this fuel will all be shipped off, shipped off site. This is uh, the Department of Energy is responsible for ultimately taking possession of this fuel. So let's talk a little bit about environmental impacts. As I talked about, the um, intake structure, which is right here, about a half mile offshore from the plant, and about a mile and a half offshore, is this discharge conduit. This discharge conduit has all these diffusers on top. And the purpose of that is to decrease the temperature of the water, such that if I'm three feet away from these diffusers, the temperature is essentially the same as it is out here. So when we intake water here at about 60 degrees, it gets discharged at about 80 degrees. 20 degrees is what it picks up. And by the time it comes out here, you have less than one 
degree temperature difference, about three feet, and then as soon as you're out beyond three feet, you don't sense a temperature difference. Notwithstanding that, we also took some actions to further mitigate impacts of us using the water. We have the Wheeler North Giant Kelp Reef, which is off the coast of uh, San Clemente. This project was completed in 2008. You can see it's an artificial reef. We are seeing actually a large number of uh, fish population coming back. And uh, the plant does experience some of that additional kelp that's off there in terms of us pulling that into the, the plant during uh, certain times of the year. We also have constructed the San Jiguito wetlands which was just recently um, commissioned and opened. As you can see, it's 160 areas of new coastal wetlands. And uh, there's hiking trails and bike trails in around there for you to, uh, to enjoy. Again, these were uh, actions that we took to offset the use of the ocean water for our cooling. So in terms of the benefits that we provide, um, San Nofri is located in a very unique situation in the LA Basin. There aren't a lot of large power plants. And so we provide grid stability. And you may not recognize how important that is until we have something like an uh, outage in San Diego, which takes out most of the electricity, would take out all the electricity in San Diego. But the grid was very unstable, and they were relying on us, in part, to come back online because of the grid stability that we provide. Again, because we are not using fossil fuels, we are reducing our dependence on those fossil fuels, and also not contributing to greenhouse gases. Again, we've got about 2,000 workers there. And in terms of our economic impact, we've done some analysis on this, about $3 million worth, $300 million worth of economic value that we provide to the local area. So let me summarize. Tried to very quickly go through the design of the plant, how we operate, the design, the things that we've looked at in order to ensure safe operation of the plant, how we were able to respond to an event where it were to occur, how we deal with natural hazards. I am, uh, as I was introduced, the Director of License Renewal. I am also the lead person for the responding to the Fukushima event. We're doing a lot of looking at the data and internalizing that and improving our process, and we're committed to learn and improve, increase our safety margin. If you want more information, you can find it here. I think this presentation will be available. And with that, I'd like to conclude and open it up to questions.